director of business resource a nonprofit that serves Sioux Falls and the surrounding communities. Our mission is to provide businesses with education, awareness, and resources to promote the successful employment of people with disabilities. I will be your moderator for today's training. Today's training is being held in recognition of National Disability Employment Awareness Month, or NDEAM. The theme for NDEAM 2021, America's Recovery Powered by Inclusion, reflects the importance of ensuring that people with disabilities have full access to employment and community involvement during the national recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. NDEAM is held each October to commemorate the varied contributions of people with disabilities to America's workplace and economy. Now I am pleased to introduce Jeff Griffin, President and CEO of our Greater Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce, who will share some opening comments. Jeff moved to Sioux Falls after 10 years of serving chambers in Peoria, Illinois and Worcester, Ohio. Prior to chamber work, Jeff developed rehabilitation and education programs for troubled youth and families for 17 years. He graduated from Ohio State University with a BA in criminology and the University of Texas at Arlington with the MS in social work. He is a dynamic leader with 25 years of executive experience in nonprofit management and possesses the unique strength of effective leadership at the intersection of business, government, and community. Jeff serves on the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Institute Midwest Board of Regents, Mid-America Chamber of Commerce Board, Sioux Falls Development Foundation Board, and has been a Rotarian for 10 years. Jeff and his wife, Rosie, have three children, Max, Alex, and Camilla, plus a rescue dog, Leo. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction and uh, the invitation to be here today. Um, I think it's great. We're still pulling things off like this. The, the challenge is I see a bunch of names and not a bunch of faces. So uh, I want to get to know people better uh, after the conference. So hopefully this is uh, just a way that we can get our names together. And I want to offer people participating in this event um, I'm interested to learn what your challenges are in this area. And I'd also be interested in sharing with you with the Chamber of Commerce, um, wh where our positions are. So Vicki mentioned, I, I had a, a, no one really has a path to Chamber of Commerce work. Uh, I didn't go to college, no one goes to college to be a Chamber of Commerce executive. And I spent many years in juvenile corrections. Um, my criminology degree and social work degree are very helpful in boardrooms, sometimes just because of the human dynamics. Uh, but years ago, when I was a, a chamber president in Worcester, Ohio, we supported a, uh, a mental health levy. And I had some, some other community members say, what's the Chamber of Commerce have to do with a mental health levy? And it, it really astounded me that there'd be that, that disconnect because um, the vast majority of employers with whom I work want happy, healthy employees. And they're employers who have seen employees benefit from addiction services or mental health services or whatever services are in place. And I think as a, as a nation, the more we move towards employing people for the value they bring and not out of some obligation, um, I think that that's a great, better path for us to be on. And we see it, I see it in my personal life. We have a 19 year old son on the autism spectrum. And, um, it's a challenge, obviously, to say, to say the least, um, but he's able to find connections and we're able to help support him. And now there's more, more employers willing to um, employ autistic young adults because of the strengths they bring. So it, it, really, it, it really is uh, the same quality of life issue that every, every human being has. And at the Greater Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce, we're working, we work very hard with our, with our leaders in peer um, to make sure we have uh, policies in place and laws in place to protect people from discrimination. But on the flip side, working equally as hard to, to reach out so that um, with work with the Development Foundation and the Chamber together in this workforce development area, you know, 
it's, it's more common to hear people taking non-traditional paths to careers that may not involve traditional college. We need to make sure that we have career paths in line for everyone, immigrant, refugee population, the disabled, uh, to make sure we're plugging people's skill sets in with the talents they will bring uh, to, their, to their employer. And um, with 1,800 businesses, we have a very strong network. And, and I'm very happy that Vicki uh, and I became a professional colleagues and friends here rapidly um, because, and even amidst the COVID, working from home and everything else, able to develop a friendship and a network because it starts with that. But the Chamber of Commerce is, is so much more than just the mixers and the networks. And I want this group to know um, you, you have our support. And if there are issues that uh, we need to advocate for should be on my radar and invite you to please, you know, I'm not the hardest guy in the world to get a hold of, keep a busy calendar, but uh, I try to make time and, and will make myself available. And I'm just really happy to, to be invited to, to participate today. Um, and I don't know uh, if I'm turning it back to Vicki or introducing the speaker, but Vicki, I'm gonna turn it back to you because you're the face. You're the, you're the friendly face I see right now. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Jeff. We really appreciate your support and for you being involved in our event today. So thank you. Now I'd like to recognize and thank our ending planning committee from Sioux Falls. Committee members include Vicki Nelson, Division of Rehabilitation Services, Pat Herman, Center for Disabilities, Carrie Bamsey, the Bank Corps, Don Backer, Rehabilitation Center for the Blind, Chastity Colton, Goodwill of the Great Plains, Kendra Gottsleben, Center for Disabilities, Don Ingalls, Raven Industries, Kelly Hoglid, Service to the Blind and Visually Impaired, Tana Burrish, South Dakota Parent Connection, Kendra Tiff, Southeastern Behavioral Health, Jennifer Erickson, Una Dolcesa Vita, Pam Brown, Call to Freedom, and Amy Stabe, Rehabilitation Center for the Blind. They were instrumental in making today's presentation possible. So thank you all. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for today's event, the Statewide Independent Living Council, Board to Service to the Blind and Visually Impaired, and the Board of Vocational Rehabilitation. In addition, the following businesses donated door prizes to those who registered for our event early. They were Topper's Pizza, Child's Play Toys, Subway, Buffalo Wild Wings, the Center for Disabilities, and Raven Industries. We will now announce the winners of the door prizes, but you must be participating in the workshop today to receive your prize. I will announce the winners and Vicki Nelson will type them in the chat box. Please respond present in the chat box to claim your prize. They will be mailed to you. The winners of the door prizes are as follows. First, I'll read the 10 uh, recipients of a large pizza from Topper's Pizza. They are Jamie Folk, Crystal Harmon, Katie Gran, Jennifer Walker, Jessica Sainert, Melissa Dahl, Danielle Skillman, Olena Munson, Nicole Voltz, and Krista Sager. The winner of the Child's Play Toy gift card is Don Ingalls. The Subway gift card winner is Kelly Hoglid. The winner of the Buffalo Wild Wings gift card is Tom Inez. The winner of the USD gift package from the Center for Disabilities is Emily Champa. And Raven Industries gave three Visa gift cards. One is for $50 and that winner is Autumn Pitts. 
And the two $100 Visa gift cards from Raven are Don Backer and Gayla Greer. Congratulations to all our winners. Before I introduce our speaker, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover. There is closed captioning available for the training, which appears automatically towards the bottom of your Zoom panel. So if you would like to use closed captioning, please be sure to activate the closed captioning feature that is located on the control panel. Also, today's training is being recorded. For those of you who need a certificate of attendance for SHRM, HRCI, or CESP credits or CRC credits, there will be a link made available in the chat box following the training with a 2021 ending survey form to complete to show that you have participated. The certificate of attendance questions will be found towards the end of the survey form. Also, the same survey form will be used to evaluate today's training. Again, the link will be made available in the chat box toward the end of the training. Next, we'd love to hear from you during the presentation. If you have a question for our presenter, please put them in the chat box that is located on your control panel. We will take a break in the middle of the presentation to answer questions. There will also be a question and answer period at the end of the session. If you encounter any technical difficulties, please send a direct message to Kim Ludwig using the chat box. Thank you, Kim, for providing your technical assistance for our webinar today. If we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we will be sure to follow up afterwards. Now, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Jana Burke. Jana is the president and founder of Mariposa Professional Services, a consulting firm specializing in ADA compliance strategies for organizations with rights and responsibilities under the law. She is a small business owner, consultant, trainer, and researcher who specializes in the ADA employment provisions and workplace strategies for ADA compliance. After 18 years in the field, Dr. Burke remains committed to helping transform how organizations do business by providing strategic planning and visioning for creating disability diversity and inclusion. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our presenter, Jana Burke. Good morning, Vicki. Thank you so much for having me this morning and inviting me to participate. Um, I've, I've had the, the fortune, the good fortune to work with South Dakota for pretty much the entirety of my career. And uh, I always love coming to your events because there's so much collaboration and community partnership. So it's wonderful to see so many familiar names. Unfortunately, not as many faces, but, uh, but it is good to, to see lots of folks that uh, I get to reconnect with after several years. So good morning to everyone and thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen since I did prepare a uh, presentation or PowerPoint presentation for the group today. So bear with me just one sec while I get that set up. There we go. Does that look good on your end, Vicki? I just want to make sure. Yes, looks great. Perfect. Great. Um, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart on both a professional and a personal level. So um, before we get too far into our conversation, I always do like to offer a friendly disclaimer at this point. Um, I am a lot of things in life, and uh, I, I can lay claim to being a jack of many trades, um, but there are a few things that I'm not. So as I'm chatting about mental health in the workplace, um, I come at it from a very different perspective than some. Um, I am not a mental health professional. Um, I am not a counselor, therapist, or any of those, um, those very worthy uh, 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 titles. Um, however, I am a, a business owner. Uh, I am a former manager that has dealt with mental health issues with my, uh, my staff in the workplace. And then I am also very comfortable in disclosing that I am a professional with a psychiatric disability. So these are things that um, 
uh, like I said, I hold very dear to myself. And uh, a lot of what I talk about um, is based on personal experiences that I've had over uh, my adult life um, as both a student um, and a, uh, a worker, um, and then eventually uh, an executive. So um, please keep that in mind as we chat. Um, I also like to make a note um, before we get started on just the use of some language. Um, you'll notice I use the term mental health issues. I use the term psychiatric disabilities. Um, I, you know, periodically I'll say I'll use the term mental illness. Um, for me, that's a personal decision, um, but I do, um, I do use those terms interchangeably as we're having this conversation. So if you're wondering why I'm switching, it's, it's purely just habit on my part. Um, but I wanted to, to let you guys know that when I'm, when I'm referring to any of those, um, I, I'm referring to that concept of, of mental health and wellness um, in the workplace. Um, so without further ado, um, I would like to go ahead and get started. And also, as we get started with our conversation, I do want to acknowledge that um, there are several mental health organizations in the US that support work to um, build awareness and education about these topics, one of which is the uh, National Association on Mental Illness. And this is actually their uh, National uh, Mental Illness Awareness Month um, or Awareness Week. And uh, it's great to be able to celebrate with you guys and talk about this very important topic um, in the workplace. So um, let's chat a little bit about what we're going to uh, what we're going to encounter over the next hours hour or so. Um, I think it's important just before we we get into um, the practical things that we all have a, a very similar uh, starting point and a foundation for our conversation. So I'd really like to talk a little bit about the prevalence of mental health issues um, in the U.S., um, also some impacts, some very real impacts of um, mental health in the workplace, particularly uh, as we're 18 months into uh, the COVID-19 global pandemic, um, and, and talk a little bit about what that looks like and, and some lessons that we've learned over the last two years. Um, I'd also like to really delve in and spend most of our time talking about the common workplace issues that come up that are related to uh, mental health, psychiatric disabilities, what the Americans with Disabilities Act has to say and the implications under federal law, but then more importantly, really focus on some of those solutions to help address some of these things um, as they come up within your organizations. Um, I want this conversation to be very practical um, so that you can take it back and, and use it within your own organizations, whether you're an employer, a service provider, or a self-advocate with a disability. And then for those of you that know me, uh, you know, one of my big mantras is uh, try to finish early and give you guys lots of resources. Um, I don't know if we're going to finish early today, so uh, I will confess that to you. Um, but I will provide you with lots of different uh, places to go if you have questions, um, if you have issues that arise in two weeks, two months, two years, so that you can really store those as part of your toolkit um, as you're doing your the work that you do. But this is an opportunity. Um, you have me face to face and you have a, a group of, of great professionals on the call as well. Um, so please feel free to ask your questions and, and get those in, in, into the chat box and we'll make sure that to cover as many as we can this morning. Um, and then if for some reason I need to follow up afterwards, we absolutely will. So please, uh, please make sure to reach out today if, if you have a question or issue you'd like to discuss. So without further ado, let's talk um, a little bit about why we're even having the conversation this morning about psychiatric and mental health issues in the workplace. Um, I think it's really important to point out that when we are starting in with this topic, it really is a pure numbers game. Um, as most of you know, who've worked in the field um, and who are committed to disability diversity, um, diversity is a lived experience that a lot of us have every day. And many of us um, encounter, even if we don't ourselves have a disability, we have a close family member with a disability. Roughly about one in five Americans have a disability. Uh, one in three of us have a close family member, that spouse, parent, sibling, child, um, uh, 
or a grandparent or parent um, with a disability. So over a third of our country is, is impacted by disability in general. And then of course, we all know that disability is one of those uh, diversity categories that we can join at any time. Um, whether it's an accident, uh, diagnosis, it really is a, a common experience. And that applies also for uh, mental health conditions. Um, so before we go too far, I, I do want to give uh, a little bit of, of definition for what's considered a mental health impairment or a psychiatric disability or a mental health issue. And it's basically... Um, any disturbance in an individual's um, thought processes, behavior, uh, emotion, um, cognition, and, and uh, information processing, that is a dysfunction of either psychological, biological, or developmental processes um, that underlie their mental functioning. And according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for uh, of Mental Disorders, um, which is kind of the Bible, so to speak, of, of psychiatric disabilities, uh, mental disorders are, are usually um, associated with very practical things like um, distress in social activities, uh, self-care, and then, of course, occupational or work-based activities. So there is a real connection between um, someone's mental health functioning and potential impact in the workplace, and we'll talk about what that looks like. The fact of the matter is, is that um, despite persistent stigma and um, lack of, of information just across the general public, um, psychiatric disabilities are very common in our country. Um, and these, this is a graphic that I, I like to share just because it's, it's pretty to look at. Um, there are, if, if you're joining us um, and using screen reading softwares or anything, uh, there are, um, there is an alternative tag that describes uh, this graphic as well if, if you need it. Um, as you can see, one in five adults in America um, experience a mental illness or a mental health episode um, in any given year. And uh, significantly, one in 25 of us deal with a, and live with a serious mental illness. So there's the episodic kinds of issues for that one in five, and then there's the chronic life management uh, long-term impact for one in 25 of us. And what's uh, another thing to keep in mind that's very interesting, um, particularly particularly those of you that are employing uh, younger workers with disabilities, or if you're a service provider for youth with disabilities, um, half of all chronic mental illness begins by the age of 14. Um, and then three quarters of those are by the age of 24. So a lot of these issues start in adolescence. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them are, are very much tied to puberty in, in a lot of the scientific research. For example, um, I, I am very candid and, and uh, comfortable disclosing my own experiences with mental health issues. Um, you know, and I, I started dealing with my major depression when I was 12. Um, so it's, it's very common that you'll see this um, develop early in someone's life, and then of course, uh, persist throughout their adulthood. Um, so keep that in mind as you're interacting with your employees um, throughout the work life cycle, uh, because things can change as, as individuals age. And it's important to keep that in mind as well. Uh, what's interesting um, is that if we can, I think, all agree that 2020 and uh, and the first part of, of 2021 has been a struggle. And uh, it has definitely been um, a different environment to operate under uh, during a global pandemic. Um, if there's probably any positive aspect of COVID-19 and quarantine and self-isolation, it is the fact that over the last 18 months, we have really had a renewed global dialogue um, about the concepts and of mental health and well-being in the workplace and just life in general. Um, as more people started to experience issues, um, as there was an increase in mental health issues like anxiety, depression, substance misuse, um, other types of behavioral condition, health conditions as um, individuals were self-isolating um, and quarantined, there just seemed to be a general awakening of this is a real problem and this is something that we 
as individuals as well as organizations and employers need to pay attention to. Um, and so if there's any positive of this event, you know, it's, it's this, that we are able to talk a lot more openly in mainstream conversations about issues um, like the impact of social isolation, um, what it meant to suddenly not be able to see friends and family um, as often or at all. Um, there's also been, for those of us with mental health conditions, there was a, a very dramatic and quick shift from, you know, standard counseling and uh, primary care to a shift to telemedicine and virtual counseling, which that creates a whole other area if you have other co-occurring disabilities because of access issues. Um, as much as we love Zoom, it's a, it's a great tool, but it's not a perfect tool um, for communication if you have some of those sensory impairments. So, uh, you know, that that's a, an issue that came up. And then, of course, probably the biggest conversation we've had, particularly um, involving women, um, is that work-life balance being able to juggle everything while we're um, at home and um, by our, you know, you know uh, insulated within our own uh, families and households and how to be a teacher, be a worker, um, manage yourself, you know, try to have a little bit of, of social interaction with people. It, it proved to be quite burdensome. And so there's been a lot of conversation recently about that work-life balance. And then, of course, you know, as we, as you know, Vicky highlighted in her introduction, um, the ending, uh, the ending theme this year is very much focused on America's recovery, and there still continues to be some financial insecurity for a lot of folks, um, housing and food uncertainties, um, those kinds of things. And then another issue that we we were seeing some conversation about um, is the impact of self-isolation and quarantine and domestic violence situations um, where uh, partners were uh, forced to be in a situation that was unsafe and uh, could result in situations where post-traumatic stress becomes an issue, um, you know, trauma, those kinds of things. So these were all very real problems and we've fortunately gotten a spotlight shown on them so that we can continue a conversation and as employers and organizations um, figure out a way to address these things head on um, in a very uh, uh, strategic way. Um, and so if, again, if there's any positives, it's that this the visibility of, of mental health issues across the country has greatly increased um, over the last year or so. So I do like to point out that there are a lot of different um, psychiatric disabilities or mental health issues. And I offered you the, the clinical definition of a mental health impairment, but these are just a few of the, the more common diagnoses that um, you'll, you'll encounter in the workplace as people disclose that they have a disability to you um, or you know, discuss some work limitations that they're experiencing because of mental health. Um, one of the, the most common conditions is depression. And um, there is a there are a lot of different subcategories within depression in terms of severity, uh, bipolar disorder, of course, uh, anxiety or panic disorders. Uh, I've already mentioned post traumatic stress. Um, some people call it disorder, some people call it syndrome. Uh, PTSD, of course, is, is a common acronym that we recognize. Um, personality disorders, um, there's a whole category of, of conditions that qualify as that. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Um, then you have your, um, you know, your behavioral kinds of things like uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or attention deficit disorder, ADHD or ADD. Um, then there's seasonal affective disorder, um, which is a, a depression that's very closely linked to circadian rhythms and seasons um, as there's different exposures to, to light and uh, vitamin D. And then of course, um, a whole category of psychiatric conditions deals with substance abuse issues or substance misuse issues, um, including alcoholism and drug abuse recovery. So this is a very broad spectrum that we're talking about today. And um, it, it very much is a spectrum. You'll have people that may have the same diagnoses, 
but very different practical implications of that within their own lives. So it's important as employers and service providers that we recognize that if someone does disclose a condition, um, we don't make assumptions and, and judgments um, based on just that that label, um, that there can be very different things that that are involved in that diagnosis or that condition for the individuals. Um, so as, a, as an example, um, I just wanted to share some common side effects of mental health conditions that have potential impact in the workplace. Um, but be aware that this is just a list and this is just a sample. It's a bit of a tip of the iceberg kind of situation. Um, and each individual will have their own uh, own struggles and their own things that they manage and deal with. So this is by no means exhaustive, but at least gives you some ideas of very practical things that may come up uh, during um, or in the workplace. Sleep disturbances, of course, are, are very common, both um, insomnia or the inability to sleep, um, as well as hypersomnia or uh, lack of energy and, and feeling like you want to sleep um, all the time. Um, so you'll hear that uh, th those both being issues for folks with mental health issues. Um, then, of course, there's changes in appetite. Some of that could uh, manifest with weight loss or weight gain. Um, and so you can see changes to um, people's physicality, lack of concentration, um, energy, interest. Uh, there's a lot of you know, lethargy for some folks. Um, and then, of course, there's other physical manifestations than just uh, weight loss or gain. Um, some individuals lose hair. Uh, some individuals are uh, bite their nails or have other kinds of, of nervous tics um, that are based and rooted in their mental health condition. Um, skin conditions are very common. Um, uh, so there, there are ways that you can notice difficulties for someone in, in those physical characteristics. Uh, low self-esteem, of course, is a very common amongst folks with mental health issues. Um, digestive issues that could have very real implications in the workplace when you're, you're making sure that they have access to um, personal hygiene uh, and things like that. Uh, migraines, tension, headaches. Um, those sorts of things are very common. Uh, memory loss, both short-term, mid-term, and long-term, uh, can be a problem for individuals with disabilities. And then, of course, as we all hear in the media, um, you know, there are a lot of, of mental health medications and uh, prescriptions to treat psychiatric disabilities. And oftentimes, those medications have pretty adverse side effects that can impact someone's performance in the workplace um, and ability to, to deal with, with different situations um, in the work setting. So uh, lots to think about here and lots to unpack. But just to kind of give you an idea, these are just a few things that, that you might have, uh, you might encounter as employees disclose and discuss their mental health conditions with you. But the fact of the matter is, is that whether it's one individual dealing with it um, that you individually are, are looking at and, and helping support in your workplace, um, these are very real things that are having significant impact in the US workplace. Um, for example, um, the Harvard Medi Medi or University Medical School does a regular study where they look at uh, the business impacts of mental health. And they uh, regularly measure some of these issues. And they've recently found that um, there's over $100 billion, that's billion with a B, um, in lost productivity every single year because of mental health conditions. Um, it averages basically to 20 to 50 lost work days or days lost in productivity for someone who's working with a mental health condition. That's a very real number to, to look at and, and kind of be shocked by, quite honestly. Um, according to the American Journal of Psychiatry, nearly $200 billion is lost, of lost earnings um, occurs every year for those of us living with disabilities who aren't able to work or have to take abs leaves of absences or um, you know, are dealing with, with treatment that takes us away from our workplace. Um, that's a lot of, of money every single year. Um, these are very real you know, economic impacts. 
Um, also, individuals with, with mental health conditions um, that work are more likely to be disciplined um, for their behavior or other uh, work limitations or work problems. And unfortunately, individuals with mental health conditions, those one in five or one in 25 of us with serious mental illness, um, we earn less money than our non-disabled counterparts or our counterparts with other types of disabilities. So not only are we seeing an impact in the workplace on the productivity and quality of performance, but we're also seeing real, very real impact for individuals um, and their economic success. And then also, unfortunately, um, individuals with mental health conditions are shown to be uh, fired or terminated from employment um, more like, you know, more often than um, their non-disabled counterparts or their counterparts with other types of impairments. So when it all comes down to it, after we've had this conversation about the numbers game, um, it's, it's an important thing to realize, um, and I've shared a, a quote with you just because sometimes other people say things in a way that really kind of hits the nail on the head, so to speak. Um, and Carla Thorpe, who um, is the associate director of um, the Compensation and Industrial Relations um, at the Conference Board of, of Canada um, in her work in, in this area made the realization that mental health is a significant business issue for us that requires the attention of organizations and you know people who experience and live with mental health issues really do face challenges in the workplace. Um, a lot are, are misunderstood. Um, they're shunned. Uh, that you know they're they're not socialized with their coworkers. They're underutilized um, because you know people don't think they can perform. And in a world where shortages of critical skills are top of mind for many organizations, employers can't afford to allow that situation to continue. And I know I'm I'm headquartered in Colorado, but I, I know it's an issue you know across the country, and I'm sure it's an issue in South Dakota we really are having a hard time finding people to fill vacant positions. And so we need to make sure that, you know, we can address some of these mental health issues and provide some of these supports so that we can tap into a very valuable pipeline of qualified talent for our organizations. So let's talk a little bit about um, the fact that it's not, um, it's not just going to benefit us as an organization. Obviously, if we need qualified people to fill our vacancies, we also um, see some very real impact and benefits for the individuals who live with mental health conditions. So as we all know, um, you know, when someone introduces themselves, it's usually, you know, hi, my name's Jana. And then we talk about what we do for a living and what we do for employment. That's a very common part of our identity. So, and that's for people both with and without mental health conditions. And the reality of, of the matter is, is that employment really does help with mental well-being for all of us because it gives us some time structure. Um, it gives us social contact and affiliation. Um, it's, it, it gives us all sort of a collective effort and purpose as we're working towards our, our organization's goals, um, as well as our individual goals. Um, it, it's part of our social and personal identity. Like I said, it's very common that when you meet someone new, you talk about what you do for a living um, as one of the very first topics of conversation. And then, of course, it's just having that regular activity, that um, that routine that is so important for all of us. And I think this is another component um, that COVID-19 and, and the pandemic has taught us is the importance of all of these things when we didn't have access to them um, because of self-isolation and uh, working from home and things like that. So um, keep that in mind that as we're talking through a lot of these things, yes, they apply to individuals with mental health issues, but a lot of this stuff is really beneficial for the well, mental well-being of all of your employees um, and all of the folks within your organization, including yourself. Um, I think if, if I had any, anything, you know, if after nearly 20 years in this field and doing this work and, and after, you know, th nearly three decades of living with a disability, um, with a mental health issue, um, I, I think what surprises me the most is that 
Um, in the year 2021, um, 31 years after the Americans with Disabilities Act passed, people with mental health conditions still face uh, barriers in the workplace and um, throughout society uh, because of negative attitudes and stigma that persist about uh, mental health conditions and, um, and what it looks like in someone's real life. Um, I pick on the media a little bit here because I think that they are kind of to blame for some of this. Um, we hear a lot of news stories that are sensationalized when um, a, you know, something happens that's shocking. And if that individual has a, a mental health condition, it's, you know, we instantly are, are taken by, you know, by, by media outlets to the, oh, it must be because this person has depression or um, this person is bipolar or schizophrenic or any other thing. Um, and then of course, you know, there's, there's the portrayal of, of mental health, you know, in film and, and on television and in, you know, in literature, um, that's not always accurate. So unfortunately, there's that barrier um, with attitudes that we have to acknowledge. But um, the good news is, you know, like I said, we're having a dialogue about these issues in a, a very different way um, after 2020 that we, we hadn't really had the opportunity as, as advocates to have, um, where it's a very real conversation about what mental health and mental well-being looks like um, that gets away from some of those, those stereotypes and, and stigma that we're used to um, dealing with and, and have dealt with in the past. So that stigma and stereotype um, is really just that misunderstanding and fear that contributes to discrimination against people with psychiatric disabilities. Um, we, we are scared of what we don't know. And for those of you that are in the disability field, um, this is very true across the, the spectrum. Um, individuals are uncomfortable, you know, dealing with uh, employees with certain types of disabilities just because they don't know, they don't have lived experience. So it's our job to sort of teach and, and educate and build awareness um, within our organizations and communities uh, so that folks, you know, can help alleviate some of that fear. Unfortunately, for people with disabilities in the workplace, um, the stigma often results in uh, very inaccurate expectations. Um, if someone comes and discloses that they have a mental health condition, uh, a lot of managers and, and supervisors suddenly think they can't do their jobs, um, or they're not effective, or they're a safety risk. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about individuals' accommodation needs under the ADA, um, what kind of workplace supports they need. Um, it also leads to negative social interactions, um, including harassment and bullying. Um, you know, we, we hear examples of, of situations where um, someone discloses their, their mental health condition and, you know, because of that misunderstanding and fear, uh, you know, people start to treat them differently. And that can have very real negative impacts uh, for individuals in the social and workplace settings. Um, what's really interesting, um, and the takeaway here is that this is a very, re this was actually a, a study that was done um, at the end of 2019. Um, there's a real disconnect in how people look at mental health issues. Um, we do trainings like we're doing today and have conversations like we're having today. And um, it, it helps raise awareness. But the fact of the matter is, is that most people with mental health conditions are still really uncomfortable discussing their disability. And that's not just at work. Um, that's also discussing mental health with their family and friends. So over half of, of individuals with mental health issues are uncomfortable just talking to friends and family. And 80, on nearly 85%, it's actually 84% of the respondents to this particular study were uncomfortable talking to their employer about issues that they were having related to mental health. On the other side of the coin though, when um, mental health went and uh, talked to individuals who did not have mental health conditions, including employers, 57% of the respondents actually believe that people are generally caring and sympathetic towards individuals with mental health issues. And um, the reality, but then on the, the, the reality is that only 
25% or a quarter of people living with mental health conditions feel like people are caring and sympathetic towards them. So there's a real disconnect between the lived experience and um, the experience of, of individuals from the outside looking in. So there, and, and part of that is because of this, the stereotyping and, and social stigma. So I always like to, to provide um, to provide you with some real life examples, because like I said, truth is always stranger than fiction. And um, we had a situation that that came up. Uh, this was actually about three years ago now. Um, an individual was working in the accounting department of a, a local car dealership. And she was eventually diagnosed with bipolar disorder. She'd actually been with the dealership for about two years and um, was started to develop some, some issues um, in, her, in her life and went to her doctor and eventually arrived at a diagnosis of bipolar. And she decides, I just noticed a typo, apologize for that. Um, she decides to disclose her condition to her manager and assistant manager because she realizes that she's gonna need to ask for some reasonable accommodations for the workplace. And very quickly, um, probably within just a couple of days of that, com that initial conversation that she had with her, her management team, um, co other coworkers throughout the dealership started using um, slurs and epithets to describe her like pill popper, psycho, head case, those kinds of things. So the question becomes, you know, does Amy have any recourse? Does she have any protections from just that, you know, what, what some people would see as, uh, you know, just people being ignorant and, and you know, throwing around and, and name calling. And the fact of the matter is, is that under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the answer is very much yes. Um, this is actually an example of a, a settlement that, uh, that came out of a lawsuit that the EEOC or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission filed on Amy's behalf um, against her employer, which was a, a dealership in Maryland. And unfortunately, in this situation, um, the, the, envi the work environment became so hostile um, that Amy was, was eventually, you know, she tried to deal with it, but she was forced out on medical leave and uh, was under treatment and medical care, under her doctor's care. And during that time, she was fired. Um, and it was, you know, because of, of her lack of attendance, um, because of her medical condition. And so it was very quick that uh, the EEOC took up her case when she filed her complaint and charged the dealership with um, harassment, denial of accommodation since she was terminated during leave. And then, of course, um, they did determine that she was discriminated against because of her mental health condition. So this is very real. This is this is not me um, just making this up or making generalizations. We see settlement agreements like this very often um, involving mental health conditions and stigma in the workplace. Um, another issue that comes up very often and, and we have, I think, um, the experience of um, the post office violence and shootings of um, the, the 80s and early 90s, um, this concept that individuals with disabilities are more violent or more dangerous than other individuals. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that individuals with mental health conditions are actually two and a half times more likely to be victims of violence than the general population. So while we think individuals with mental health issues are, are going out and causing violence, they're actually more likely to be the victim of that violence. Um, employees with psychiatric disabilities are, are really uh, very frequently victims of harassment, violence, and bullying in the workplace. So that's something as supervisors and business owners uh, and operators that we need to keep an eye for um, to make sure that we're, we're creating a safe workspace for all of our employees, not just individuals with, with uh, or in, in, including individuals with mental health conditions. Um, don't panic, I'm not going to go through this entire slide. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that um, safety is an issue, and it does become an issue sometimes for individuals who may have um, behavioral problems uh, because of their mental health condition. And uh, 
always keep in mind, even under the Americans with Disabilities Act, safety supersedes everything. And, um, you know, as as employers and business owners, it's our responsibility to maintain a safe workplace, both for our employees, as well as our customers and the public that we interface with. Um, and so, you know, if there becomes an issue because of, of, of a safety risk, um, it, we do have recourse under the ADA to deal with those issues um, with our employees with mental health conditions. But keep in mind, this is, this is a very extreme, more the exception than the rule. And there are some very uh, stringent, you know, stringent requirements under the law um, have, with how we deal with them. So, it, you know, it needs to be based on, on medical fact, um, you know, not just subjecture and, uh, you know, suspicion. It has to be an individual assess individualized assessment of, um, an indi of a specific employee's um, ability to safely perform the functions of their job, um, you know, those kinds of things. So there, there are some limitations, um, but keep in mind that just having a history of a psychiatric disability or being treated for a condition does not auto automatically mean that the individual is a direct threat or a safety issue in the workplace. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can do to alleviate some of that risk if, if there is any that, that, uh, that exists. So for those of us that, uh, that are self-advocates, um, as well as managers and supervisors, there's a lot that we can do to help create and encourage stigma-free workplaces um, within our own organizations. Uh, I'm a little bit biased because I do this for a living, um, but I, I'm a firm believer in education um, for employees of all levels within your organization. It's very uh, easy to do brown bag lunch and learns and uh, you know put up posters in the break rooms and just little um, non-threatening ways to teach our, our employees uh, a little bit about mental health and, and what that means. Um, I think that, like I said, with COVID, this has created a really good opportunity for us to be more proactive in our education efforts about mental health and mental well-being in the workplace. Um, I think it's important to also encourage dialogue and to um, make sure that we're creating that safe environment for our employees, both with and without psychiatric disabilities, to talk about stress and work-life balance and workloads and uh, outside commitments and those sorts of things um, so that, you know, individuals can manage, you know, in the workplace in a healthy way. Um, I think it's also, of course, in, important that as supervisors and managers that we discourage the use of stigmatizing language like those terms that Amy encountered at work, you know, head case, pill popper, uh, psycho, uh, schizo, you know, any of those derogatory terms that often get thrown around quite a bit um, for that are related to mental health issues. And then, of course, if we have the resources and ability, um, it's also a, a good piece of advice to invest in mental health benefit programs and uh, workplace wellness programs, um, whether that's, you know, encouraging physical activity, um, whether that's, you know, access to an employee assistance program or an EAP, um, it, you know, insurance that includes mental health benefits. Um, all of these things help create that culture of a safe environment for all of your workers, um, including employees with psychiatric disabilities. Um, another big component that comes up um, is related to disclosure. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And then we'll take a quick break to field um, a couple questions before we, we finish up this morning. Um, just a friendly reminder that uh, disclosure, not all disabilities are visible. Um, so because of the universal symbol of accessibility, which is our little blue wheelchair man, um, a lot of, of folks automatically jump to those physical disabilities uh, when we're talking about um, the employment of folks with disabilities. But for many of us with psychiatric disabilities or mental health issues, um, those are non-obvious. Um, there's really no physical manifestation of our symptoms or side effects. So keep in mind that um, you may be dealing with an employment situation uh, that 
mental health is at play and not realize it um, because that formal disclosure hasn't happened yet um, or you're just not aware that there's more going on under the surface uh, than you realize. But some practical things to keep in mind um, under the statute, under you know, the civil rights law that is the ADA, um, the ADA actually does not require disclosure. There is nothing that says that an employee or an applicant has to tell you that they have a disability, psychiatric or otherwise, um, under the law. The only exception to that is if they need an accommodation or workplace support to allow them to either apply for the job, participate in the pre-employment process, the interviewing and those kinds of things, um, or to actually perform their job duties, um, then they will need to disclose that disability, particularly if it's not obvious. Um, other than that, it is the individual's uh, prerogative. Um, disclosure is always going to be voluntary, and it can occur at any time during the employment relationship. So you'll have folks that will tell you in the job interview about their disability experiences and what that means in the workplace. You'll have people that work for you for 20 years and never say a word about uh, their medical condition or their psychiatric disability that they live with. So it really can run the gamut, but an individual can share that with you at any time during their employment relationship, and it could potentially trigger responsibilities under the ADA, like providing reasonable accommodation for them. And then if you do have someone who comes to you and discloses that they have a condition, um, it's important that we don't retaliate against them um, for any disclosure related issues. So obviously we can't treat them differently. Um, if they have a disability, we can't terminate them automatically because they've disclosed a disability. We can't assume that they're a safety risk or a direct threat in the workplace. Um, we can't deny them an accommodation um, because they didn't tell us when they started um, that they had a mental health condition. Um, we can't hold them to a different performance standard than we, we would before we knew that they had a disability. Um, these are all things that are prohibited under the ADA. So very practical things to think about. Um, if you're an employer, a few things to, or a couple things to keep in mind. If you are aware that the employee has a mental health issue and they have disclosed it to you um, at any time, um, it is okay because it is a non-visible, non-obvious disability um, it is okay to request reasonable medical documentation if they need a reasonable accommodation. So you can ask them to verify that they have a mental health condition to just keep as part of um, the accommodation file for HR purposes. Um, that is okay because it's not visibly obvious and you just need to, to verify that they have the condition and they have a need for accommodation, that there's a limitation that you, that you need to address. Um, however, if you do receive that information and you receive that disclosure, you need to make sure that that information stays private and confidential. Um, it's only shared on a need to know basis um, and that you respect the, the individual's privacy um, in, in, you know, maintaining control of who they tell about their mental health condition. Um, if the individual has not disclosed and you are not aware that there is a formal diagnosis or that they live with a mental health condition, um, but you suspect there might be something going on, uh, keep in mind as an employer, your primary responsibility is to maintain a safe workplace. So if they, there's been a, an outburst or uh, they threaten someone, um, you can take appropriate uh, measures to discipline that behavior um, because that's a violation of, of your workplace violence policy or um, you know, your behavior standards within your organization. But it's very important that you focus on the individual's performance and their behavior um, and not go down the rabbit hole of asking, you know, do you have a mental health condition? Is there something, you know, is there a diagnosis that you haven't told us about? Instead, what you want us to talk about is, you know, 
Jane, you've been coming to work and you've been uh, you've been tardy and we have an attendance policy. We expect you to be here in a timely manner. Um, so this is our expectation and this is what we're, your performance. Oh, you know, is there something that we can do to uh, help make sure that you're getting to work on time? You're focused on the behavior. You're focused on the implication of that performance deficit and you're not going anywhere that that could be construed as disability related. It provides Jane an opportunity though to disclose at that time, maybe she's having sleep issues related to a mental health condition. Um, and that's what's causing the tardiness. So by focusing on your, your performance, you're creating an opportunity for her to potentially disclose if she chooses to. Um, but focus on the performance, focus on their behavior, don't try to, to diagnose or guess that there's a mental health issue that's causing it, um, and then provide very clear, consistent consequences um, if there's inappropriate behavior from your employees. So for Jane, um, let her know, you know, we expect you to, to be to work on time and, and to work the hours that you're scheduled. Um, you've already had four tardies. Um, if you have another four tardies, we'll have to write you up. Um, and then you know, we will look down the line at potential um, corrective action and other kinds of discipline that may need to take place. So again, focus on the behavior, focus on the performance, not on the, the cause of it. Um, and but you're allowing an opportunity for Jane to raise the issue of dis disability and disclosure if she chooses to do so at the time to request accommodation or um, to, to explain um, the performance deficit or the performance problem that she's having. So Vicki, I am going to take a break and, uh, and see if there is um, anything that we need to deal with question-wise. So I think, I'm not sure if you or Kim will throw some at my direction, but feel free if you have a question to let me know. Hi, Jana. This is Kim. Are you able to hear me? I am. Okay. I don't have any questions so far, but I did put a um, message in the chat box if there's any questions for you to either put them in the chat box or if people are comfortable and coming on the screen to ask you a question, that is completely fine. So good. just give it a couple of minutes, whatever you wish. And um, I did want to point out, we did have a question very early on um, about the, the, the need to take notes or, or frantically write things down. Um, and I assure you that uh, one of us will share the presentation with the audience um, after we're done today. Um, so you will have access to this. Um, I, did all, I do also include a lot of resources for you. Um, and so I include links to all of those and that way you can you can get to the that information fairly easily and fairly quickly so um, rest assured that we will definitely um, get you this information so you don't have to frantically take notes as we continue our conversation today. All right, we actually do have a question Jana um, can an accommodation be denied by the employer if not reasonable. Um, thank you for that question, Vicki. That's a very, um, very pertinent one, particularly uh, as, as conditions change and, and we're still trying to figure out um, how we're operating our organizations um, with folks, you know, some folks working from home, some folks in person. So that, that is a very real thing. Um, ironically, I'm going to ask if I can hold off on answering that uh, for just a minute because um, the next topic of conversation involves reasonable accommodations and uh, the requirements under the ADA. And we'll definitely answer that, uh, that question of how to determine you know, if, if what the person's asking for um, is reasonable and as an as a extension of that is required under the ADA. And if it's okay, since people aren't jumping on and, and throwing things my way, um, we'll just go ahead and, and jump into that conversation. Um, and that way, you know, if we've got more time at the end, if, if folks want to save their questions then, until then. Uh, I also realize that mental health issues are, are always a little bit of a, 
uh, an uncomfortable topic. Uh, I do this training. I do training about this topic a lot. And uh, I know some folks just don't want to bring questions in front of the group. So uh, I remind you, please, if, if you have a situation you are dealing with, either as a, a self-advocate or as an employer or service provider, um, and you don't want to talk about it today during the presentation, feel free to reach out to me. and I'd be happy to, to answer or discuss anything with you offline. So um, as I mentioned, the, the next place to, to go with our conversation is to talk a little bit about the ADA and its requirements related to workplace supports um, for those with mental health. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that, bear with me a sec, um, the ADA does have a provision for those of you that may not already know. Um, that for qualified individuals with disabilities, including psychiatric or mental health issues, um, the ADA requires that employers provide uh, reasonable accommodation to allow them equal opportunity um, to work and perform their job duties um, and participate uh, equally in the workplace. And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, Reality shows that people with mental health issues can both contribute to the workplace and be self-sufficient. Um, and there's a lot of us out here that, uh, that can, can provide proof of that. And reasonable accommodations or those workplace supports truly do offer people with mental health issues um, the ability to be qualified for their jobs and to maintain their productivity and efficiency at work. Um, the ADA defines accommodation as any change in the work environment or the way things are done within the organization that enables someone with a mental health issue um, to enjoy equal employment opportunity. Um, that is a very generic definition by design um, because accommodations are an individualized assessment to figure out what an individual's workplace limitations are and what supports might help them the most effectively. So it is a, a dialogue and um, an interactive process, a conversation between the individual and the employer to figure out how we can support this individual so that they can do their jobs and do it productively and effectively. Um, and so it, it Accommodations can look very different depending on um, the individual's needs. We did learn during COVID uh, because we all had to sort of shut down and go into uh, remote work mode, uh, several lessons um, that, that apply to this. And uh, I wanted to share a couple of those. This is actually from uh, some studies that the Job Accommodation Network um, have done over the last several months um, to look at kind of how accommodations work uh, in today's current workplace. Um, the big thing to keep in mind is that flexibility is, is hugely important. So um, there may be situations if you have someone uh, with a mental health issue um, who's requesting an accommodation, you may need to adjust your interactive process a little bit. Um, you may need to um, handle things a little bit differently. Um, there, there's a lot at play and uh, we've learned quite a lot um, as we've had to sort of shift how we manage the accommodation process. Um, but the important thing is, is that um, there are a lot of accommodations that are available to individuals with psychiatric disabilities um, that are fairly easy to deploy and um, actually can benefit a lot of your employees, regardless if they have a, a mental health issue or not. Um, on the following few slides, I provide a lot of um, examples of um, ideas for accommodation. Um, I've grouped them together by the, the type of, of accommodation that, that it would be considered or categorized as. I will not go through everything on these slides just because there are so many of them. They are for your, your future reference and uh, I encourage you to, to take a look through the bulleted lists. But kind of some of the big areas where people with disabilities, uh, with mental health issues benefit the most um, one area, of course, is workplace flexibility, and this can be flexibility in policies within your organization, um, practices, 
the way things are done, um, the way that individuals are supervised, um, those kinds of things. To allow someone with a, a psychiatric or mental health issue to fit into the workplace in a, in a more effective way. Um, that can be everything from um, how you pace their workload, uh, flexibility in scheduling, um, the ability to make um, you know, phone calls to, to therapists or, or uh, uh, treating physicians you know, during work hours, uh, breaks, you know, providing training on conflict management um, or conflict resolution, lots of different categories um, of accommodations that help provide more flexibility if it is needed by someone with a disability. Um, we also deal quite a bit um, because you are providing accommodations and adjustments and supports for uh, workers um, with non-obvious disabilities, a lot of times an issue that comes up um, involves coworker resentment. Um, you get folks noticing that uh, maybe someone else has access to a support that they haven't gotten. And the very first question is, well, why does, why does this person get to take an extra break in the afternoon? I don't get an extra break. Um, and so it, it's very important to keep in mind if you're, as a supervisor, if you're fielding those types of questions, um, maintain the, the confidentiality and privacy of the worker with a disability. And this applies whether it's mental health or not. Um, the ADA prohibits you from sharing that information with coworkers. We need to make sure that um, that we're not oversharing uh, about someone's potential medical condition. And there's a lot of things you can do to address these concerns. Um, you know, you can, you can say that you're acting for legitimate business reasons. You're um, acting in compliance with various federal and state labor laws. Those are all generic enough that you're not triggering a disability conversation or disclosure. But my recommendation and what I've used in the past as a manager when I've dealt with this kind of, of resentment issue is I communicate with my staff that I try to support the needs of all of my employees. And I actually turn it back on them and say, what can I do to support you? What do you need to be able to do your job better? It gets the, the focus and the spotlight off of their coworker who may have a mental health condition. And it, it talks about what their needs are. And it shows that I'm supportive of them and I'm willing to, to do what I need to do, whether the ADA is involved or not, whether it's a disability issue. Um, but it's, a, it's an effective little tool. It's very subtle, um, but it's something that really kind of helps diffuse tensions when um, there's some of this coworker resentment. It's also really important to educate your staff and your organization that accommodation is not preferential treatment. Um, it's a workplace support. Um, it's, you know, obviously required under the ADA and, um, and just help educate and, and let them understand the purpose behind providing accommodations for all workers. And when possible, if you can extend certain accommodations to all employees, regardless if they have a, a disability or not. For example, if you've realized over the past 18 months that working from home is a real possibility for your organization, allow that for all of your employees, not just individuals with disabilities um, who may need that for disability related purposes, but because it might be the best business decision. It might make good business sense, not because the ADA requires it, but because it's just the best thing to do from a business perspective. And that's okay too. Um, another category that, that comes up very often related to reasonable accommodations are accommodations um, in how we supervise or manage someone with a mental health condition. Um, as I mentioned, some of those side effects um, involve like memory, uh, process, information processing, those kinds of things. So putting, you know, putting uh, 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 instructions in writing. Um, providing, you know, follow up to meetings and conversations with an email, um, maybe having a little bit more structure for some employees than your others, uh, one on one supervision, um, these kinds of things can really help someone with uh, a mental health condition, be able to manage their daily workload. So there may be a call to action for managers and supervisors to get involved and tweak how they do things a little bit um, to address the, the needs of someone with a mental health condition. 
Um, there's also modifications that you can make to the work environment, um, both, uh, you know, basically the physical space that someone does their jobs. Um, you know, modifying the work area so that they have minimum distractions, uh, maybe placing if you have a cubicle situ situation where there's a lot of background noise, uh, maybe putting someone who has ADD or ADHD that gets distracted very easily, maybe putting them in the back of the workspace so they're not near the entrance where there's a lot of traffic. Um, maybe it's allowing them to use um, equipment like white noise machines or um, other kinds of technology that can help with minimizing um, distractions. Um, for some individuals, they can uh, 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 they can be triggered or or have adverse reactions to um, noise or uh, smoke, um, heavy you know heavy odors. Um, fluorescent lighting can trigger migraines and things like that. So you, you can obviously, you know, make modifications to your workspace that address some of these environmental issues. Um, another common one that comes up is um, if you have someone who's a service animal user or um, in the workplace, even emotional support animals uh, may sometimes come into play as, as a reasonable accommodation. And then, of course, uh, another common one related to flexibility is that remote and work from home opportunity where you can, um, you know, make sure that you're supporting them with what they need at um, a, a, a remote work location um, to address any workplace limitations that they're having because of their mental health issue. So, uh, again, these are broad categories with some specifics that you can uh, can use, but the gamut, it really does run the gamut in terms of types of, of accommodations that are available. Um, another one would involve emotional support. Um, this could be, you know, providing mentorship, uh, coaching, uh, peer counseling, um, how you communicate with someone with, with a mental health condition, um, having workplace supports like employee resource groups or business resource groups, um, those sorts of affiliate, uh, affiliate program, affiliation programs um, that allow someone with a, a mental health condition to have access to these services. So, Lots of different opportunities, um, including um, leave as accommodation. Um, sometimes it may be necessary for someone with a mental health condition to use either accrued paid or unpaid time off um, to allow them to get treatment or um, recover from you know, a trauma or you know, various other things. And that can be considered a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. So very broad spectrum. Keep in mind, though, the ADA requires that the accommodation be effective, that it eliminate the um, employment barrier that the individual is experiencing, does not have to be the exact accommodation that the person has requested, doesn't have to be the best, doesn't have to be the most expensive. Um, if you can provide an alternative option that still eliminates the workplace barrier, you would be in compliance with the ADA. And there will be some situations where they request an accommodation that is not reasonable, um, as Vicki uh, asked in her question. Um, and it is okay if for legitimate business purposes, if something is too expensive or it's a financial burden, um, if it is an administrative burden and you just, it, it changes the nature of, of your organization or how a job is done, you can deny the request for accommodation um, on those business related grounds. Um, at that point, though, it's important as an employer that you go one step further and say, I can't provide this accommodation for you, but is there something else that we can do? Is there another support that might be as effective or effective in a different way um, and not and continue that conversation through the interactive process? Um, if you have questions about accommodations, there are so, so many resources out there about this topic. Um, please feel free to reach out to me, and I'm happy to share those. Uh, and then, of course, I do include those in the research uh, or in the resource section of the presentation as well. Um, I just want to discuss a couple quick issues before we turn over um, to the resources and uh, and wrap up for our for the morning. Um, we've already talked a little bit about conduct issues. Um, it is an issue or it, it's a problem and a, a situation that does come up at times with workers with mental health issues and conditions. 
Um, and it is okay as an employer to hold your employees to conduct standards that you apply across the board. Um, and that includes to individuals with mental health conditions. Um, it is important though that um, it's job related, it's a business necessity, and you're consistently applying these conduct and behavior standards uh, to all of your employees, not just picking and choosing what you enforce um, based on someone's mental health and uh, manifestations of their mental health condition. Um, as I said, you want to focus on someone's performance, um, the behavior, the impact it's having on work. Uh, you want to make sure that you're communicating without judgment, um, that you're engaging the individual in a conversation to figure out, you know, this is, this is the problem, this is the conduct issue or the performance problem we're having, how can we address it and support you so that you can do, you can improve that. Um, and really focus on moving forward, not getting bogged down with someone's diagnoses or um, uh, overburden them with information or with requests for information about their mental health issue. Um, it's really important though that you involve the individual in this conversation because no one knows better what it's like to live with their condition and their disability than they do. So you want to make sure that you have their input. Um, and also if you develop a plan, um, whether it's an individualized performance improvement plan, whether it's an accommodation, um, they're going to have to live with that. So you want to make sure that you get their buy-in as early as possible so that they're able to um, implement it effectively. Change is always hard for all of us. And so for individuals with mental health issues, um, change management becomes very important. So I've offered a few tips on, on how to make sure that you recognize this, this uh, potential issue and um, address it head on and communicate with the individual in case you are making any changes. That can be anything from uh, job restructuring to uh, changes in supervision, um, changes in workplace. If you have to move to a new building, um, you know, helping prepare that person to manage those that, that changed environment will really help in the long term. Um, employee medication, we've already mentioned that briefly about uh, the side effects of those, but um, it is not your responsibility as an employer to monitor someone's uh, medication, and you don't have to make them take their medication. You don't have to monitor that they are taking their medication. Um, that is well above and beyond the call of duty, um, and that is more of a personal service, which is not required under the ADA. Um, however, if, if you're starting to see performance issues because of uh, side effects of a medication, um, the same advice holds true here. Um, focus on the, the conduct, focus on the deficiency, um, explain the consequences if, if they continue to behave or perform in a certain way. Um, and then it's up ultimately the employee's decision how they want to uh, react and respond um, to that and, and whether they want to make improvements or uh, you know, take their medication more regularly or things like that. Um, and then in the meantime, I always offer, um, you know, a little bit of, of humor into the world as a person who lives with this every day. Um, there are also a lot of, of coping strategies and self-advocacy um, that you can do within the workplace for yourself as an individual with a mental health condition. And, uh, you know, I always joke that, you know, some days I, I wake up and I can conquer the world um, and other days uh, it takes me two hours to, to shower. Um, so, you know, it, it ebbs and flows for me as an individual. And then there's sometimes that you just have to, you know, like the, the cat in the meme in the presentation, sometimes you just have to tell yourself you're a shark and really go and attack your day. So um, it, it, there's a, a few things to consider as a self-advocate. Um, I encourage individuals to stand up and tell your story. I mean, if you're comfortable there and, and you've reached a point in your recovery or your self-management, you know, to to really be a self-advocate and stand up as a, a leader um, to help raise awareness and, and address some of that stigma and stereotyping that happens. Um, because then at that point, you become kind of a beacon for other people who are li living uh, 
um, with mental illness and mental health issues, um, and and you you offer some some hope that uh, that things are going to be okay. Um, it's also important though to recognize that you do have limitations because of your mental health condition, but you also have a lot of strengths that you can bring into a workplace, and you can communicate that with your supervisor and your managers. Um, do your research and keep learning and and sometimes it really is just getting through a day at a time, um, but also make sure that you're extending yourself and other people that you encounter uh, in your workplace who may be dealing with mental health issues a little bit of grace and uh, you know humor never helps or never hurts a thing for sure. Um, a couple of resources for you and then i'll jump over to the chat because I see we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, I have dumped a ton of resources for you. There are a lot of publications out there about the ADA and psychiatric disabilities that I've included um, for you in the presentation. Um, also information from the EEOC about performance and conduct, um, psychiatric disabilities, your rights as someone living with depression, PTSD, and mental health conditions. Um, reasonable accommodations and undue hardship, um, and then leave in the ADA. Uh, I encourage you, if you haven't used the Job Accommodation Network before, go take a look at their website. They are a fabulous free resource to tap into um, if you're doing work in this area. Um, in particular, they have an A to Z of disabilities and accommodations on their site. So if you're dealing with someone with a different type of, of mental health or psychiatric disability, most likely they have a resource out there on how to figure out um, how to uh, how to accommodate them in, in your workplace. Um, they actually have specialists on staff who are cognitive uh, specialists um, who can help come up with individualized accommodation solutions for you as well. Um, so if all else fails, reach out via email or uh, or give them a call on their hotline. And then I, I don't like to just dump boring uh, legal stuff on you. Um, you know, there, there are some great books out there about living with mental health, managing mental health in everyday life. Uh, I'm a, a fan of Jenny Lawson. She's she's wonderful and she makes me laugh. So uh, I like to always share her her book as something if you're interested in jumping into. Um, there are some there are a lot of COVID-19 and mental health um, resources out there. Uh, I've included those from uh, NAMI. Um, Mental Health America, and then the CDC also has a, a great uh, landing page about supporting uh, worker uh, mental health during um, the pandemic. So uh, great resources for you to take a look at if this is something that you're, you're dealing with in your organization. Um, if you're an individual or you work with individuals with disabilities, a lot of tools to help you figure out when to disclose, how to disclose, um, because so many mental health conditions are non-visible, we have a lot more prerogative and, um, and, uh, and freedom in our disclosure processes. So here are some tools for you to use um, to, to make the decision whether and how to disclose to a, an employer. Um, there's also a, a, a tools that are available for both employees and employers. Um, regarding accommodations and how to manage that process. Um, I've included links to quite a few of those for you as well. Um, and that way you can check those out if you are interested in that. Um, if all else fails, there are lots of organizations you can reach out to about this topic. Um, anything that you have with the ADA centers uh, or the with the ADA and questions, I encourage you to reach out to um, the regional center here in and Region 8, which is the Rocky Mountain ADA Center, um, you can get in touch with them through the 800 number or their website. Um, and then, of course, various um, mental health organizations and uh, mental health promotion uh, in the workplace for you to take a look at. Um, if nothing else, you've had a chance to meet me and get to know a little bit about me, and I am happy to uh, follow up with anybody. Um, but I, I do want to point out as we wrap up uh, that Lila offered a, a great insight that um, hiring people that live with disabilities, obviously including mental health as well, is an investment with them and can also be a positive experience for employees that are not living with disabilities. And that is very true, Layla, uh, or I'm sorry, Lila. Um, 
it really is you become an ally if you don't have a disability, um, but you also become a self-advocate that can really affect change within organizations um, and really help raise awareness of disability issues. Um, so it really it is a win-win situation. It's a very bottom line um, improvement for all of our organizations if we hire folks both with mental health conditions and with other types of disabilities as well. If there's any other questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. If I know we're against the hours, so um, I encourage you to reach out to me if you'd like. I'm pretty easy to get in touch with. Um, you can give me a call, you can shoot me an email. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I also maintain a, a Facebook page for my business. So if you're interested in mental health and employment, I, I tend to share quite a few resources about this as well. So uh, I'm around and I'm easy to find and uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or issues or you need resources or anything like that. So I will turn it back over to uh, Vicki, Kim or who else or whoever else is gonna take over. Yeah, hi, this is Kim. Um, I'll just kind of close up or wrap up um, today's presentation on behalf of Vicki Stewart. Um, Jana, first of all, we cannot sincerely um, tell you how much we appreciate your time. Um, information um, is it is very valuable. So hope everyone else um, felt the same. And again, um, we appreciate everyone's participation and we will send out the presentation following the training today and um, looks like you're getting a lot of compliments, Jana. So thank you, wonderful presentation. So glad it was beneficial and uh, I, I look forward to seeing you guys again in, in real life, um, but also if, if uh, hopefully we'll connect in other ways as well. So thank you for having me this morning. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you once again, Jana, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Take care.